Hello and welcome to EIT Digital Lunch Talks. And we launch, we launch the Lunch Talk series today with uh, Pekka Tuomala, Principal Scientist at VTT Technical Research Center of Finland Limited. And Pekka will explain why so many women feel chilly indoors. It doesn't seem to be the case with me <laughs> now, <laughs> but I've been busy. So uh, enjoy it, and Pekka, the floor is yours. Thank you. Any questions, please wait until the talk is over. Thanks. OK. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's my great pleasure to introduce a new potential innovation related to these individual thermal sensation aspects. First of all, what is human thermal sensor is all about? To be brief, it's such a uh, service solution concept which enables fulfillment, fulfillment of individual uh, expectations related to thermal environment and also uh, it can improve uh, energy efficiency of building by uh, avoiding unnecessary heating and, and cooling. So there are these two aspects both occupants as an end users and buildings when thinking about energy efficiency. And the secrecy behind this concept is such traditionally we have this more or less fixed set point temperatures when controlling indoor environment. However, in this concept, which I'm now uh, presenting to you, the idea is to define a demand controlled uh, procedure how to uh, maintain de uh, decent and reasonable thermal comfort for individuals. And we feel that that's a new paradigm. Such procedure has not been presented any earlier. I decided to uh, divide this presentation in four sections. First, I try to give some kind of motivation for this development work. Then some uh, technical approaches, how to fulfill those individual uh, expectations. I try to emphasize some benefits and some uh, uh, comments also for this competition. There are several uh, key drivers behind developing this. The first of them is, is that uh, we as a mankind are spending more and more time in urban environments. There's a huge increase in, in, in the percentage of people spending their time in urban uh, environments. Another aspect is aging. Uh, especially in, in uh, Western countries, uh, the population is getting older and that puts some pressure to adjust thermal environment a little bit more accurate and, and a better argued way for the elderly people. And one motivation is also here. I know you can't uh, <coughs> read the text, but uh, Mika Pantsar made, an, made, an, made a point by saying that smart solution should adapt to the user not the other way around. So traditionally, for example, when we are sitting here, I'm standing here, but when we are uh, spending our time as an occupant in this very building, the building automation system assumes something about our expectations. And if we feel either hot or cold, it needs some kind of actions from, our, from us uh, as an end user. So why not to shift that paradigm in such a way that the buildings would adapt to our basic needs. And also one trend for the future is such that we are going to uh, live in a little bit different environment in the future. We are going to, uh, we are becoming more and more mobile. We are not lo any, any longer spending that time in our own office rooms by ourselves. We are traveling and moving uh, between spaces far more in the future compared to the uh, past. So there are these mega trends which put more pressure to adjust our thermal environment more and more individually. And the key is demand based. Uh, as a background, uh, and explaining actually 
how big these differences between individuals in terms of thermal environments are. In Swiss, uh, Switzerland, they made a field study in an office building in which they asked four times a day uh, of those uh, research scientists spending their time in an office building. They monitored their uh, clothing activity level and uh, perceived thermal environment of those occupants spending their time in this building. And the results are quite shocking. Here are a uh, couple of uh, graphics describing the results, but I need first to explain that on the horizontal axis there is this monitored indoor uh, air temperature. And on vertical axis is thermal sensation uh, perceived by the occupants. <coughs> And for example, traditionally, here in Finland at least, when we are designing the buildings, we fix this set point temperature typically to 21.5 degrees centigrade. For certain people, this temper temperature level is too low. For uh, most of the people, it's more or less okay. And the same temperature is, for some people, even too high. And this can be seen this individual <coughs> variations a little bit better in these other graphics again on the horizontal axis indoor uh, air temperature and vertical axis is proportion of, of comfortable the higher the value is the more comfortable the people are these thin lines are uh, giving the statistics for individuals if you take a closer look to this person his preference temperature according to this field study, is a little bit above, uh, above 20 degrees centigrade. And if, if we take a little bit closer look up to this person, I would estimate that her preference temperature is around, is around 25. So traditionally, we have fixed the indoor temperature in a fixed set point temperature value. And at the same time, according to these field tests, there is about five degrees centigrade difference between individuals which temperature level they prefer. And this is the motivation for developing this uh, service concept or control co concept, however you would want to call it. So we, as a human beings, we are individuals. Traditionally, uh, this conventional heating solutions are based on spatial and, and temporal variations taking care about what is the outdoor temperature and so forth but the lacking part is here for example when this very space is heated during this heating period no attention is paid to our basic needs and still we have this five degrees centigrade difference between the preferred temperature for individuals and to be short what is the explanation for that? We, as a human beings, have different sizes and shapes of our, of our body. So there are these huge variations between individuals, what kind of temperature levels they would prefer. And then some uh, basic facts, how we uh, suggest that this, this challenge could be solved in the future. First, some <coughs> basic facts about those relevant boundary conditions which are needed when estimating this, this individual thermal sensation and thermal comfort uh, parameters. The most obvious one is natural temperature, for example, air temperature of, of this space and also what are the surface temperatures in this space. How cool is this window? How, how warm is underfloor heating, heating uh, surfaces and so forth? And related to space, not only the temperature, but also the airflow velocity and humidity of the air uh, having a true impact of heat transfer between human body and environment. So these are the re uh, parameters related to the space. But then some basic guidelines and, and, and uh, boundary conditions related to occupants. The most important parameter related to uh, occupant is how much heat we generate based on our <coughs> metabolism. And that is depending on two aspects. What is our uh, 
individual and private body composition and activity level. And not only the metabolic rate, but also clothing uh, naturally has impact on how we feel and sense the space from thermal uh, sensation point of view. If you think, for example, two athletes, this gentleman and this lady, they, they, they are athletes, yes, but it's obvious that they have very, very different amount of metabolism generated by their body. And we, in, in general, we all have our individual body composition. So on these slides are listed those required input parameters which are needed to evaluate and predict uh, thermal sensation and thermal comfort. But how do we actually quantify thermal environment of ourselves? There are uh, international standards and actually there are two key parameters describing how we feel this thermal sensation. The first one is thermal comfort index. It ranges from value minus four to plus four, but as a scientist I'm a little bit skeptic about this parameter because it doesn't have or include any information is, it, is the space too hot or too cold. And actually, there is another parameter which is called thermal sensation describing what is the balance between a human body and his or her environment. Uh, the thermal sensation index value zero means that a person is spending his or her time in the thermoneutral conditions. Then, if the temperature is felt too, too high, the first uh, Verbal description is slightly warm, the second one is warm and then hot. And the sign actually is, is telling into which direction are we deviating from these thermoneutral conditions. In the negative side, uh, we are having too low temperatures. And to have some kind of impression, what does it actually mean if, the, if we feel thermal sensation index value number two? There is a statistical analysis made behind these uh, parameters and actually if we feel on this scale number two, meaning warm, roughly speaking 75% of uh, people spending their time in such conditions are feeling dissatisfied. So this numerical value two, meaning warm, corresponds to such level that roughly speaking 75% of people are dissatisfied because of this, in this case, too high temperature value. And this is something I'm, I'm proud about. We have managed to develop at VTT quite unique human thermal model, uh, which is documented in one doctoral dissertation, which I supervised a couple of years ago. And by this, <coughs> excuse me, by this human thermal model, we introduce these boundary conditions related to space and occupants. And this human thermal model, first of all, it describes a human body by 16 body parts. For example, upper arm is still subdivided to bone, muscle, fat, and skin layers. So this is the true anatomy and the secrecy behind defining this individual thermal cessation relies on the fact that each occupant, or actually the body composition of each occupant, is defined individually, paying attention to the, of those true uh, facts. And this human thermal model, it includes not only this anatomy da data or model, but also this control model. And actually we have introduced in this simulation tool and calculation tool all those basic mechanisms, how we as a human beings are doing our thermal thermal control. Actually, blood circulation is the key driver. In typically something between 50 and 80 percent of heat transfer in the human body uh, is made by blood circulation. And I have many times said that I'm certainly not a, a doctor in medicine. I'm a doctor in mechanical engineering and the way I see the human, what the human body is, that human body it's a heat exchanger. It's such heat exchanger trying to maintain our brain and inner organ temperature level uh, at the temperature value of 37 degrees centigrade. And then 
all those deviations from these uh, neutral uh, conditions which we are facing, they are controlled by blood circulation and other, other extreme also shivering and, and sweating. And uh, this model also uh, includes these basic heat transfer mechanisms uh, between a human body and environment. For example, evaporative heat transfer, when we are sweating more or less, is related to this uh, air humidity level. Convection between human body and environment, it's related to this air temperature. Thermal radiation, when I'm standing next to this cold window, my upper arm is uh, having this true heat transfer by means of radiation based on my skin temperature level and the temperature level uh, of, the, of that window. So we are covering anatomy, control mechanisms, and this thermal interaction between human body and his or her environment. And this is also something I'm quite proud about. We have made a pilot case here in Otanemi area. This is a photograph of my colleague in, in our office room. And we have actually piloted this, this approach in such a way that we pay attention to this space data, occupant data, in such a way that we monitor online these temperature levels, humidity level, and flow velocity in this uh, space. We also detect who is there and what kind of activity level he or she has. And this monitor data is then delivered to this human thermal model, which is up and running on a server. And this human thermal model includes not only the human thermal model, but sensor data. So that's the logic behind this abbreviation, human thermal sensor. It's a kind of fusion sensor uh, combining both physical devices monitoring these, these environmental uh, parameters and these calculators. And the basic idea is that after we are aware about this space-related and occupant-related boundary conditions, we can define this demand-based control signal for this uh, building service system. For example, this is a snapshot uh, from the uh, display uh, in, in our room, and here on the timeline we have a weekend, then Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and we have arrived, or well, the system has detected that we have arrived on Monday morning to our workplace. The uh, human thermal sensor de uh, defines the thermal sensation index, it's too low, so what happens on the Monday morning, the input uh, supply air temperature level is elevated in such a way that this thermal sensation index value obtains the value zero. So it's, it's a thermal neutral condition by these surface and air temperatures for that person at that time. I had a lunch during the uh, noon, I came back and then uh, during the night time we could run this in an energy saving mode. So this is the profile. <laughs> I didn't do that. It's Mayday, Mayday. So we have introduced this uh, human thermal uh, <coughs> sensor in, in our uh, space and uh, we are uh, th this uh, control is based on this monitored real-time uh, sensor data. Uh, we have calculated real on real-time this optimal control signal for this uh, heating system, and it's, it's delivered uh, to this uh, building automation and control system. And in the future, hopefully, we can find a little bit larger buildings and, and areas where we can test this. So we monitor space data, we monitor occupants, we deliver this information to this human thermal sensor, we define the optimal control signal for heating uh, solution system. 
So this is about this approach. And if we compare this new concept to the traditional one, typically at the moment, for example, in this space, we have uh, temperature sensors. I can't locate them, but they typically are. Quite seldomly, the uh, occupancy is, is monitored. But the basic idea in the conventional system is such that we monitor a space, we give that information to existing building automation and uh, control system, and this defines the set point temperature, more or less fixed uh, set point temperature for the, for the heating system. And our idea is to monitor not only the space data, but also the occupants on individual level. We deliver that data for this uh, cloud service and define well-argued demand-based control signals for a uh, billing service system. And actually what this also uh, gives as a surplus is such that it also allows us to monitor what has happened in the past. Since we are on real time defining these optimal uh, parameters for individuals, so some new features for these smart building aspects uh, are also introduced. And we feel that this human thermal sensor actually is a missing link between those traditional sensor data and building service systems. And then some words about the benefits. The first one is quite obvious. Uh, since we feel uh, better from thermal sens sensation point of view, that's good. It increases well-being. But that's not so informative for building owners, for example, or tenants. So how much this better uh, thermal sensation and, and more pleased uh, uh, occupants, does it have any economical impacts? And actually, an international group of researchers has claimed that in case we are able to adjust our thermal uh, our temperature level by plus minus three degrees centigrade, uh, meaning that we define this optimal temperature level for individual. Naturally, it's depending on, on the type of work which we are doing, but they have estimated, based on the large group of studies, that something between three and seven percent of increase in working productivity can, can be obtained. I'll give you some numbers later on. And the second uh, benefit of this uh, human thermal sensor approach is related to clean tech and, and saving energy. When you are sitting here, you are not uh, your own uh, office rooms. They are not occupied, and still, they are heated at, 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 at this very moment. And actually, the occupation rate of, of office building desks at the moment is less than thirty. So more than 70% of time of working hours, our desks are unoccupied. And at the same time, we are spending quite a lot of energy, especially here in, in Nordic countries for heating purposes. But to give some kind of perspective, uh, I made a study with my colleagues. I'm not allowed to tell which building it's, but it's, it's here in, in the autonomy area. And uh, I collected all those costs related to labor, facility, and energy. So there, these are real numbers. In this uh, building, there were a certain number of people uh, getting paid by their uh, employer by a certain amount of money. I'm not allowed to tell that either. But the total cost of labor is almost 18 million euros year. And this building is owned by a certain building owner, but the rental rate in this building is something like 2 million euros uh, a year. And the energy cost in this building is around 200,000 euros. So if I now compare these uh, two numbers, what are the labor costs? And compared to this, 
few percentage of increase in working productivity. Uh, I dare to say at least that it doesn't make any sense to save energy in wrong places if we jeopardize the working productivity. But these numbers hopefully give some kind of motivation why certain kind of indoor environment service concept should be developed in such a way that we as occupants would be uh, pleased from thermal per uh, perspective in, into these, uh, these spaces. Uh, we have demonstrated this protocol and concept in office buildings. However, we have had some preliminary discussions also with uh, healthcare sector. And actually, there might be very, very potential applications found. Because if you think about a hospital, patients coming from surgery, spending their time in recovery room. So actually, it's nothing more, nothing less. It's a question of our life and death told by these uh, representatives of hospitals, what kind of thermal uh, environments can be delivered to those patients? Should they be done individually or just as a bulk or general? So this human <coughs> thermal sensor application is beneficial for all such cases where, where the thermal satisfaction is an issue. Then some words about this competition. What are those existing solutions at the moment? Vast majority of technical solutions are based on these fixed set point temperature values. Uh, if I feel a little bit cool beside this window, where should I now adjust the temperature level of this space? Ingrid, please help me. Where can I find those manual devices? There. Yeah. Yes. Could I have the chair and go up there and, and turn on? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But nevertheless, uh, in majority of buildings, we have still these fixed manual systems. They should be turned to clockwise or anticlockwise, and hopefully something happens. Some advantage, more advantage solutions are uh, introduced, for example, by Danfoss. They have these programmable uh, devices into which the, they can put set point temperatures for different weekdays and, and, and so forth. But still, some manual programming is needed. I think the most advanced solution at the moment has been developed by Nest. And by the way, Google bought that company paying something like 3.2 billion US dollars. So at least I think that Google is, is believing in, in this uh, reasoned, well-reasoned uh, control of thermal environment. And this NEST solution, it includes uh, fuzzy logics, algorithms, temperature and presence sensors, but it doesn't pay any attention to these individual expectations. So that's why I'm, I'm proud to tell that it's still missing this demand-based control of, of thermal environment. This is the last slide. I've been made a question, is this human thermal sensor is a vitamin or painkiller? Uh, I refuse to <coughs> decide between these two. I, I rather think that human thermal sensor is rather a medication service, something beyond vitamins and, and painkillers. It doesn't remove the pain, however it cures the, the disease. It makes, makes online diagnosis for patients. And even before the patients are having any symptoms. It gives an uh, individual prescription 24-7. And actually, it also gives the uh, medication to the patients without their own awareness. And this uh, medication service is quite safe, easy to use, satisfaction guaranteed, no side effects. And actually, this gives this answer to Mika Pantsar's comment that smart solutions should adapt to the user, not the other way around. Thank you for your attention, and now 
I ask, uh, you can ask, and I can answer to those uh, questions which I'm able to. So, thank you very much. Thank you. I have a question for you. So, do you think it would be possible, and if, and in what time frame, to have a personalized atmosphere around the person? Because even if you could adjust that with some cumbersome actions there, I, I have different needs than you, so could we have this like bubble around us? Using yeah, actually, there are such such solutions available in in uh, certain hospitals, for example. Mm. And also, there are more or less personalized uh, devices, smaller devices. For example, as simple as fan on the table, it's blowing to your face. Yeah. But what should be uh, the velocity of that airflow rate? Mm. And actually, I I know that there are. Uh, such uh, ceiling ventilation devices in, in American markets, but still, mm -hmm. it does. Those solutions they still lack this information of this individual expectation. Mm -hmm. And I've been told that uh, sensors uh, at the moment are extremely cheap. Mm -hmm. Control devices are not that complicated anymore. So when we are designing the future buildings, we should pay more attention about these uh, sizes of these controllable areas in a space. So the answer to your question, how, how close we are to those mm -hmm. more or less personalized situations, we are taking the very first steps to that direction. Thank you. Any more questions? Yes, uh, we have two. First one. Yeah. I get stuck into my work and then I notice that I'm hungry only because I'm shivering. Mm -hmm. I don't have enough energy to warm myself up even yeah. with all this extra action my body has learned to do when mm -hmm. I'm cold. Yeah. And uh, uh, like for example those situations, what if the person is sick? Uh, is that uh, information somehow monitored and used in the yeah, that, that's a good point. I would like to say that uh, so far we have managed to model those basic features related to this uh, thermal control of, of the human body. And I know that when we uh, go to a little bit more detailed aspects, for example, getting sick and getting hungry or, and aging is also one aspect. I've been told that when we people are getting older, uh, our thermal regulation system is changing a little bit. It's, it will be accurate enough uh, and equally accurate compared to the uh, younger uh, occupants, but it gets slower. So there are these specific uh, detailed aspects and also one, one feature which is not covered by the current version of this human thermal model is, is how well we are adapting to seasons. Because there are, uh, at least here in Finland, we have four seasons. Every now and then we have warm summer, <laughs> fall, winter, springtime. So there are indications that there are some adjustments made by our body, how well we can adapt to these different seasons. But it doesn't remove uh, that fact that there is this five degrees centigrade difference between uh, optimal temperature level for individuals. So in big picture, this would bring some new features and, and, and opportunities to maintain decent temperature level for us as individuals. And naturally, as, as you told, there are such periods of time when we get sick. So of course, we also need some kind of uh, device or, or whatever to control the room temperature the way we should. So we should not be dictated by a computer cloud in, in Silicon Valley and saying, you can't feel hot. <laughs> Naturally, you, you need to have this ability to override control. Oh, there is a possibility to find it out uh, for the machine that 
directly uh, the brain computer interfaces are opening that, those possibilities. Mm. Uh, Epoch, for example, mm. uh, you're familiar, yeah. is capable of even, at least according to the manufacturer, of uh, sensing an emotion. Mm. You know? yeah. And uh, that's already yeah. pretty badass and very useful for this yeah. research, for example. Yeah. Thank you for your question and comment. Another question was? Well, my question was uh, about the seasonal mm. changes in mm. the model as well, because uh, I noticed myself that uh, my range uh, can vary from uh, even 7 degrees uh, or 7 or 8 degrees, depending on. And uh, I know, know that in Singapore they are selling winter coat uh, uh, for the 28 degrees uh, period. Mm. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, but uh, maybe more. Specific question as a, as a node director here. So, in order to reach this uh, seven percent performance improvement, mm. uh, do we have to go down or up with the temperature? It depends. <laughs> it depends. It depends for work. some people, for example, in this very space, the temperature level might be too low mm. when we are staying in, in this this uh, space. Some for some occupants, it might be too high. So there is no rule of thumb that uh, on higher temperatures, uh, people get uh, more. And, uh, and, uh, when, when the temperature level is too high, we lose efficiency because of, of we get too hot, we feel hot and, and things like that. But on the other hand, if the temperature level is too low, we also lose our concentration. And, and that there has been done some cognitive uh, psychological studies how well occupants perform under different conditions. So, so this rule of thumb, something between <coughs> 4 to 7 percent increase in working productivity. It's order of magnitude. Thank you. I have another question. Uh, thank you. Um, it was very interesting that some of the examples you gave really explained the use of it. What I don't understand is you talked about occupancy sensors. Do you have those data, but can you actually, do you have an algorithm to make optimal for several people optimal conditions? Thank you. This is the question made, made each and every time. It's, it's an important one. When, when, uh, when there are several people in the very same space, how to manage that, if I understood correctly. Uh, <coughs> naturally, this approach uh, suits the best way in, in single person rooms. However, if, for example, each and every one of us had some kind of ID, and the system would uh, detect uh, who are present here. The space parameters would be monitored. So each and every one would have his or her optimal temperature set point value. And after that, we could, if we would like to, we could define that it's, it's an average. It's a minimum. It's a maximum. Nevertheless, it's better argued compared to the existing one. So if everybody is feeling too cold, for example, why not to elevate the temperature level? Or, as, as I had a short discussion earlier before this speech of mine, I don't know your uh, experiences about those overcooled uh, hotels or, or office buildings in Northern America, for example, during the winter time. It doesn't make sense at all that we cool down these uh, hotels and, and office buildings, for example, to 21 degrees centigrade, and spending quite a lot of energy. And everybody is feeling too cold there. So we could adjust this average value for those being uh, people, occupants being present, and give that as a better argued and, and better suitable for this audience. We had, we had one, two, you yeah. first, you are first. Yeah. Yes. I wanted to ask, uh, so the system should know the person and yeah. should know his parameters yeah. uh, here in order to, and uh, we, which parameters there are? I'm glad you made this question. <laughs> uh, because here is a graphic uh, showing, uh, first of all, horizontal axis has a parameter of body mass index. 
vertical axis is percentage of body fat. Each white circle represents a female citizen. And each black square represents a male citizen. So naturally, there are variations. For example, male on average has a correlation between body mass index and percentage of body fat on this line. And there are above and below values. So what is needed from one occupant is height, weight, gender, and then this muscularity index. Are you above or below this average value? And they could be crooked and put it to a server. So Ingrid wouldn't know your body mass index or your percentage of fat. All is needed is that you, ha you carry on uh, an ID and the system uh, detects which ID is present and then it's calculating. So there is a privacy aspect naturally related to this. But to put it short, age, gender, body mass index and, and your fitness. That gentleman and another question there. <laughs> yes. Uh, just a short uh, question. Uh, can it, be, can it um, uh, implement like a productivity, like a feedback mechanism, like historical data and productivity? And like your thoughts about this, it's possible or it's not possible? I think it is possible. We just need to have some kind of funding granted by Tekes or some, <laughs> some other organization. Actually, this productivity, it's, it's a hot topic. Yeah. So there is a huge potential how much this productivity can actually influence on, on somebody's uh, productivity and, and, and success in, 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 in working environment. But there are not that many well-argued studies on individual. This uh, data which I showed you earlier by Duon and, and his colleagues, it's based on 10,000 people spending their time in, in, in different European countries. But on individual level, it would be fascinating to study that a little bit more uh, in more detail uh, and accurate manner. And we, we would be willing at PTT at least to launch such study in which the spaces would be controlled and uh, test persons would do some kind of psychological or cog cognitive tests and then we would try to find out how strong or weak links there are on individual level. But the order of magnitude is there. Okay, I think the last question for this lunch talk. We can continue off offline, yes. Yes, uh, I wonder uh, all this data that you need to input to the model, mm -hmm. you, you, you gather it by some other measures. Mm -hmm. How feasible is that? measure that on a passive way, like if you have, for example, a camera there, like an infrared camera or some other like uh, video processing that you can analyze mm -hmm. the video and see the people and have some, some idea for the model. So what was the question actually? Yeah, so how do you know, I mean, if, if you could take, for example, a video stream and, and analyze that? That's one option, yes. Yeah. So, so far we have tested several uh, sensor <coughs> applications, some wireless and some wired. And, and the key is to collect this, these boundary conditions, which are air temperature, relevant surface temperatures, <coughs> air velocity, humidity from the space itself. And it doesn't matter how you collect this data. You just collect that. Okay. Thermal camera, it's, it's an option, thermal camera. Like thermal camera, camera it's, it's one option, yeah. It's one input, yeah. Sorry? It's a sensor. Yeah. Yeah. One application would, of course, be if, if you could somehow connect it to weight loss. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Yeah. With that nice... I put a little bit better, yeah, some, some dating aspects as well. Uh, <laughs> Ingrid, one, one more detail I would like to uh, make a point. And so 
as a scientist, I want to argue all those expressions I made. And two dull facts. How much fat tissue is generating heat? Four milliwatts per kilogram of fat. And how much muscle tissue is generating heat? When we are asleep, it's almost one watt per kilogram of muscle. So this is the motivation why we need to be aware whether we are over here or here or there on, on this, uh, in, in this graphics. Because there are three orders of magnitude difference between heat generated by fat tissue compared to muscle tissue. And Ingrid also made a, made a question uh, in, in this introduction why a female uh, would like to have higher temperature levels compared to males. Males typically have uh, 5 to 15 kilograms more muscle tissue in their body. Mm -hmm. So people, uh, male citizens generate on average more heat uh, internally and that's the, the final expl explanation why male citizens would prefer to have a little bit uh, lower temperature levels compared to females. More muscles. Okay, well, thank you, Becca. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. And welcome to the next one.